Am I audible, sir? Good afternoon. Am I audible, sir? Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, you are audible. Good afternoon. This is Dibendu Sharkat. Just wanted, wanted to check whether I am audible or not. Yes, sir. You, you are audible, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. I am there. Welcome, sir.
a very uh, good afternoon to all the respected dignitaries panelists and participants on behalf of nidm i vivek sharma young professional cultural heritage drr welcomes you all to this webinar program on imbalance in uh, sundarban and its probable strategies to combat disaster challenges organized by national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs government of india in collaboration with shrima mahila samiti this webinar aims to identify the challenges of uh, sundarban regarding socio economical geophysical and economical and understand the iucn red list of ecosystem framework and to assess risk vulnerability mapping reconstruction policies safe migration and coastal and land uh, planning and understand how to regenerate uh, living standard economic settlement and ecological resilience to promote research capacity building of community and uh, interdisciplinary involvement of disaster risk reduction of sundarban to find out uh, strategies to mitigate the degradation of biodiversity of this uh, mangrove heritage and implement the long term coastal planning to ensure disaster risk reduction let us begin with the inaugural session firstly i uh, would like to introduce the program chair person of this webinar Shri Tajasan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM. Shri Tajasan is presently working as Director General uh, Fire Services, Civil Defence, and Home Guards, and also holding the additional charge of Executive Director, NIDM. Now it would be my honour to introduce the Program Director of this webinar, Professor Santosh Kumar, Head GIDRR, National Institute of Disaster Management, being a disaster risk reduction policy planning and capacity. a development expert he has 35 years of experience in different positions in the development planning and drr sector a phd in economics he studied gender and development in ids sussex uk and received professional training in disaster risk management from israel backed with international work exposure at the world bank and inter uh, governmental body of sac now i would request to mr sabarna saraswati project manager srima uh, srima mahila samiti to carry forward the webinar welcome sir uh, thank you vivek sir uh, good afternoon all uh, i am now like to uh, uh, call uh, ms bani saraswati secretary shrima mohila samiti for briefing the project program brief ma'am over to you ma'am Greetings to all. Greetings from I give my special thanks to the officers of NIDM that they proposed us to organize a webinar on cultural heritage or any other heritage disaster risk reduction. We are happy to say that we have organized this webinar. on a very authentic issue that is sundarban sundarban as we know is the unesco world heritage site and also the disaster prone area it is becoming more vulnerable day by day and also uh, it is the site of many species especially for many endangered endemic delta endemic delta and also for wild bengal tiger people of this heritage delta have been frequently suffering from repeated disaster i think we will come to know about various issues and various problems and strategies to overcome it is it from the our delegates we have invited resource persons who have very deep knowledge on sundarban we will be engaged to hear from all the experts and uh, all the experts and experienced persons we are happy that this webinar is being organized in collaboration of nidm and sima mohila samiti now i am briefing the two days program
Mr. Ali Haider, junior consultant NIDM, will conduct inaugural session. Sri Tajhashan IPS Executive Direction NIDM, he will give the keynote address. Mr. Shantanu Chakraborty, President Society and Director Initiative for Social and Health Action, in short, Disha. He will give the special address. After his speech, uh, the technical se session will be started. Mr. Dibendu Sharkar, IS retired, will deliver his speech on causes of vulnerabilities of Sundarban policies to reduce and strengthening people. Dr. Sanghumitra Mukherjee, CEO, Siti Ram, Siti Mitram, Environment Management, she will, uh, she will speak about pollution and risk Sundarban challenges and wish. Dr. Sharon Bishar, DST, Women Scientist A, Government of India, Department of Agriculture, Metrology and Physics, BCKV. She will get, deliver her lecture on improving climate resilience and of the community through integrated in integrated nature resource management in coastal Sundarban. After it, the open house discussion will be led by uh, moderators. Professor Santosh Kumar, NIDM, will give concluding remarks. And Mr. Shaborno Sarshoti, project manager, Srima Mohila Samiti, will give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for giving the project briefing. Uh, now I am like to uh, call uh, Sir uh, Professor Shantosh Kumar, head DIDRR, GIDRR, NIDM, uh, for giving us the keynote address. Uh, sir, please. Uh, due to few special urgency, uh, I am now like to uh, call uh, Mr. Shantanu Chakraborty, President, Society for Direct Initiative for Social and Health Action, Disha, uh, for delivering us uh, the special address. Sir, we like to hear from you about the Shundarban and the special address for our project, for our webinar that is Imbalance in Shundarban and its probable strategies to combat disaster challenges. Sir, please continue. Sir, is there any problem? Sh 
শান্তনু চক্রবর্তী স্যার স্যার এনি ইস্যু Uh, as you know, I am like to uh, introduce now the background of this project. In consequence, with this crown in being the largest and only major existent mangrove forest on earth, Sundarban is also credited with the recognition for passing, possessing some of the largest and most complex ecosystem in the world outside the tropical rainforest. Sundarban with its rich treasure with diverse flora and about 453 fauna wildlife is a very unique example of coexistence, blend and balance that exists with, within ecosystem. However, the exa exemplary trace of very forces that had created it coupled with ever increasing unplanned, destructive and exploitive human activity have created an unprecedented level of threat to the very existing of Shundarman. Now, uh, I like to uh, start our technical session. Uh, uh, I like to call now Mr. Vidibindu Sharkar. He is also a renowned person in West Bengal. He is IS, retired IS, and we all like to hear from you, sir. He will introduce us about the causes of vulnerabilities and if Sundarban and policies to reduce and strengthening people. Okay, Sir. thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zrabono. Thank you, uh, NIDM authorities, uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas on the Indian Sundarbans, the vulnerabilities, and probable solutions as well. Uh, unfortunately, probably sharing option is not there as yet. I need to share my screen. Zrabono, someone has to give me that sharing uh, option. Yeah, I think it is now there. Open system preference. Yes. Just a sec. Uh -huh. Screen recording is allowed for WebEx. Okay. Let me check now. Google Chrome is there.
Oho. I'm having this problem of sharing Cisco OBX events. Is it, is it not so? Yes, sir. Uh, but that one, I'm not being able to check that in my privacy setting. Security and privacy, Cisco WebEx meeting is enabled. But when I'm trying to check this Cisco WebEx events, this is not coming. So what should I do? Let me check a second time and then finally decide to do without it. Grant access in system preferences. I'm trying to give that grant. Open system preferences. Uh, screen recording is that option. I'm adding Cisco WebEx. Okay, till the time that works, uh, let me do one thing. Let me share this to the mail from which I have got it. Is it possible? You can you can do it from there, the presentation. Or should I send it to Shaborno? Sir, please send me. Okay, okay, okay. Just a sec. Inbox. Shaborno Srima Mohila Shamiti. Okay. Uh, reply attachment. Give me a minute. Desktop. Open. Give me 30 seconds. Yes. This is Shundarban presentation for NIDM SMS. Uh, Shabarno, you can open that from your computer. And then let me. Yes. Okay, let me start the talk. Uh, even if it is not there. Uh, okay, please start your uh, version. I am yeah. trying. Okay, okay, okay. So, this is basically uh, what I would try to do is that I would discuss a little bit about the Indian Sundarbon, a very brief one slide kind of a content. And then, uh, what are the causes of what are the vulnerabilities? What are the causes of vulnerabilities? And what uh, might be the policies to reduce vulnerabilities and building resilience? So, it's basically a vision for the Indian Sundarbans. That's what I'll try to develop in the next, say, 20 minutes. Uh, I think this is an information which is there uh, to most of the participants over here that uh, Sundarbon uh, is a transboundary kind of an entity because this is here in India as well as in Bangladesh, uh, a total length of 10,200 square kilometer of mangrove forest out of which 4200 square kilometer is in india and in india also there are two districts only north of Pagana six blocks and south of Pagana 13 blocks and in bangladesh this is entirely in the kunla division of the country so <coughs> indian side there is also another 5400 square kilometer of non-forest area which is included in the indian sundarbun so all these 19 blocks, parts of the, the people, the habitations and all those areas in these blocks are also part of this. Uh, so there are 19 blocks, as I said, uh, 13 in South 24 and 6 in North 24 Baganas. 190 gram panchas. There are 102 islands out of which 54 are inhabited. Total population in the Indian Sundarban is 4.6 million as per 2011 census. And if you talk in terms of vulnerability, you will also uh, need to understand the dependence. So 10 million people are dependent on the Sindhurban ecosystem in India alone. And there are 
2600 plus fauna and 1400 plus species of flora and 91 mangrove species as high as 91 different mangrove species are there. Uh, this is frequently ravaged by cyclone and storm surges, rising sea level consequent to climate change and global warming is resulting in uh, submergence of area. So, uh, now if I uh, try to understand the picture of vulnerability, how it compares. The frequent storms and cyclones uh, major uh, kind of causes of vulnerability as well as vulnerability itself. When I, because I will be talking about the storms and cyclones, storm surges and flood in both these slides. One is the picture of vulnerability, the other is causes of vulnerability because these storms and uh, cyclones are also result of certain other factors like global warming and all those things. We are especially uh, the kind of uh, frequency increase in this is certainly a result. So that is why this is vulnerable vulnerability part and also uh, this ultimately increases vulnerability of the local people and the entire habitat. So that is why this is uh, a cause of vulnerability as well. Abject poverty is very much noticed there, inadequate livelihood opportunities are also there, dwindling forest based livelihood options. Earlier people used to have a lot of forest based livelihood options, but gradually these are dwindling because of the destruction in mangroves and uh, the kind of destruction of the uh, aquaculture habitat, the fishing habitat and all. So that is also a major problem. Increasing cost of farming and decreasing farm productivity, even uh, the areas where people go for farming, uh, agriculture and all, agriculture, horticulture and all, uh, the cost is increasing and productivity is declining. So, that is a major uh, problem. Disease prevalence, I uh, will talk about this disease prevalence when we will come to the solution part as well. Uh, so, some of the specific diseases which are there, especially the pelvic disorders amongst women who have to spend a lot of time on salt water is a major problem there. Migration is there very much uh, in every household you will see one or two people who have migrated somewhere else and also uh, there are uh, instances of human trafficking, some are very open, uh, a lot of human trafficking is in disguise, uh, people are given in marriage, especially the girls are given in marriages but actually they are trafficked out. So these are some of the pictures of vulnerability. Then causes of vulnerability, if I come to that, uh, what are the causes of vulnerability? First of all, increasing stress in the ecosystem due to disruptive human activities. So, uh, we the human beings uh, have also taken up a lot of uh, activities which are ultimately disruptive to the ecosystem. So, that is a, a, a cause of stress and that increases vulnerability of the people and the ecosystem there. Pressure on the carrying capacity of the ecosystem due to population pressure. As I said, uh, close to 5 million people are staying there in the area and uh, the dependence is much more. Even if we talk in terms of uh, people staying there, this is uh, telling upon the carrying capacity of the entire ecosystem of Sundarbon. So, uh, it uh, might have been uh, different had there been much less people uh, living there because it is often not a place for uh, human habitation, but uh, as we usually go, as we usually do, we have built our habitation everywhere. So, there also we have uh, taken uh, land from, we have accessed land, uh, recovered land from the kind of river banks and all and ultimately we have built our habitation. So, those are also uh, doing a lot of problem to the ecosystem uh, and uh, certainly the slow onset disasters due to the effect of climate change. Uh, the initial disaster that we are talking about was uh, basically uh, uh, the cyclones and all those things are very strong. But if, if you have the slow onset disasters which are the results of climate change, uh, sea level rise is there, loss of land mass due to erosion and sinking islands are there, inadequate flow of sweet water is also a problem and especially in relation to livelihood uh, opportunities. Rising river beds is a problem, erratic monsoon, monsoon is gradually dwindling and salinization of land and water. These are some of the causes of vulnerability, there are much more, but I right now I am talking about uh, of these ones only. Has that been, uh, the presentation has not been loaded, no? Yeah. Uh, sir, can you? Yeah. Have you have you got that presentation? Yeah, yeah, I, I am. I am. Just, just, just load that. Let me check. Yeah, load that.
and come to slide so is four. It, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Yes, come to side floor, slide four. Next slide. And go for full screen mode. Full screen. Mm -hmm. Next, next, next. Yes, this is full screen. Yes. So these are the causes of vulnerability. I have already spoken of that. Just have a look. Uh, okay. Then go to the next slide. Yeah. See, uh, I am also supposed to talk about the government policies to reduce vulnerability. Unfortunately, uh, are there any specific policies for the Sundarban? Concrete policies to address the specific issues faced by the uh, people in the Indian Sundarbans? At the national level, I think no. At the state level, I think there also we lack. Uh, basically, what has happened, there is a department of Sundarban affairs, which is supposed to look after everything in the Sundarban area. So the affairs of Sundarban are supposed to be managed by the department. But unfortunately, that department has become uh, an implementing department with certain specific wings like engineering wings, agriculture wings and uh, those kind of three, four, uh, five wings, which are implementing certain schemes and the fund is coming from the different government departments departments only. So that way the Sundarban uh, Affairs Department or even the Sundarban Development Board are not a policy making uh, institution at all. Uh, even if you look at uh, the state of uh, environment report or our climate action plan, wherever you go, you see very little reference. I am not saying that in the climate action plan uh, of West Bengal, uh, Sundarbon is not there. Sundarbon is certainly there, but so that chapter has got uh, say seven, eight pages only. And in this seven, eight, this is climate action plan, you think of that. And in these seven, eight pages, uh, it's basically what the forest department in Sundarbon is doing because this has been brought out by the environment department and environment and forest department work very closely. So whatever forest department is doing that is uh, kind of elaborated over there. So it's again not an action plan for uh, the state to improve uh, life and livelihoods, improve the ecosystem to de uh, kind of uh, decrease the vulnerability of the people over there in the Indian Sundarbun. So that's not there. At the national level, no nothing. At the state level, uh, I, I have not found anything of very imp uh, of importance as such. Uh, recently, there has been an effort to develop a paper kind of a thing. A, a committee was formed and that committee was to recommend certain measures to address vulnerabilities in the Sundarban, but uh, we, uh, the academicians and the activists and the CSO people, they have not as yet uh, been able to see exactly what came out of that exercise. So what I'm saying is that uh, not much of a government policy is there as of now. And what actually is required, see, if you, if you look at Indian Sundarbon, it's only 19 blocks. It's only part of two districts. And now there is a talk that there will be a new district of Sundarbon, and that's great. But at the same time, what I'm saying is that uh, there is uh, uh, nothing very specific about Sundarbon because a special issue or a, a special area needs certain special attention. It's not implementing NADGA, it's not implementing, say, the forest department schemes, it's not like imp implementing different schemes of the agriculture or horticulture departments. It is, uh, has to be seen in a comprehensive manner and what can improve the lives of the people, what can uh, uh, kind of uh, increase the capacity of the ecosystem. Uh, so all those things are to be part of that. So that kind of a thing has not happened as yet. Go to the next one. So uh, in absence of that slide, please, Shabarno. Yes, in absence of that, we uh, were uh, talking of, uh, practically it was part of a, a, a kind of an assimilation process of whatever has been done on Sundarbun and whatever different people have suggested, the researchers and others have suggested on what can be done on Sundarbun and our uh, own uh, observations, our own learnings also were put into uh, together in some kind of a paper. So uh, based on that, uh, what I thought that, okay, uh, we may talk about different, in different components of uh, the policy which can be taken up. First of 
of all, if you talk in terms of the ecosystem and protection and restoration of the ecosystem, what is the status? This is the largest salt tolerant tropical mangrove forest. We all know uh, in the world where the carbon capture rate is 45% higher than the Amazon rainforest. It's such uh, is the status of the Shundargons. And uh, what can be uh, the probable interventions to ensure that protection and restoration of the ecosystem is possible? Uh, there are suggestions of joining certain river networks upstream and subsequent revival of those rivers. Uh, is, uh, that day on 13th, uh, Professor Shukoto Hajra uh, talked uh, in this forum itself and he is a strong proponent of, along with other researchers, a strong proponent of that river linking project. So that's uh, an area which probably needs attention. Mangrove plantation, everybody is talking about the mangrove plantation. Government uh, last year uh, had a target of a 5 crore mangrove plantation and they uh, are claiming that we have been able to uh, plant 10 crore of mangroves. So be it 5 crore, be it 10 crore, uh, I am not sure uh, whether the kind of attention that a plantation drive on mangrove, whether, uh, first of all there are questions whether mangrove is something which is, has to be planted. But even then, uh, there are uh, possibilities there as well. But uh, any systematic planning in plantation probably is I mean, at least uh, partially lacking. So uh, that is an area where some civil society organizations are working, government is working, forest department is working, NRDG is working. So that is an area probably which needs attention. Community-based joint forest management, carbon capture, all these things are very important and these are all possible over there. REDD plus uh, uh, to attract finance because of the, the doing a large scale intervention in Sundarbun requires a lot of fund. So the RDD plus uh, kind of framework can also be taken into consideration, at least can also be explored to uh, see what kind of finance can be attracted for that. Artificial oyster reefs, again Professor Shukoda has spoken of that. Uh, so uh, that probably uh, is something which uh, gets the uh, first uh, kind of uh, rush of waves uh, arrested at the sea level, but at the seaside itself, seaward side itself. And then uh, the reefs are also, if you have, if you create artificial oyster studies, the oysters will also join. So they will also come. So that is another uh, area. And reduce erosion, trapping suspended sediments, and seaward expansion. So all these are possible through this uh, reef and all those things. And embankment with natural fiber as base. We are uh, kind of developing embankments, but those are very really concrete embankments and all. We are not sure uh, whether these will be able to withstand. And also, uh, it's not possible to build concrete throughout the coastline. Uh, in certain areas you can, in certain areas you cannot because uh, it, it needs huge funding as well. So probably it would be better uh, to think of the natural protection route. So that is also possible. Uh, probably uh, we need to consider that in association with uh, some uh, hardcore uh, intervention in uh, cement concrete. So it's not, what I'm saying is that it's not that we need to shun cement of concrete totally, but probably it's a combination uh, and especially on both the sides, the seaside uh, or the riverside and also on the side of the embankment on, on the countryside also, some uh, kind of uh, plantation would be required. Uh, go to the next slide, please, Shavana. So from ecosystem production, uh, protection, I am now coming to the issue of water. Uh, yes, lack of fresh water for agriculture and sanitation uh, is a major problem. Drinking water also is supposed to be a problem, but that is mostly uh, when at least government is trying to address is uh, very hard. So probably that might not remain a challenge uh, in the long run. So I am talking about specially uh, agriculture uh, water and all those things. So rainwater harvesting might be a probable solution. See, yearly 1.7 million cubic millimeter of rainfall is there and drinking water need is 14,000 cubic meter. So 100 square uh, meter of roof, this can provide water for four people for six months. So if we think of that kind of a rainwater harvesting, probably uh, this might be one of the solutions. But I'm saying, uh, again, I need to uh, emphasize that uh, in uh, an urban area, rooftop rainwater harvesting may be uh, a major uh, kind of uh, a good thing. But in rural areas where these kind of houses are also uh, not 
that much prevalent, uh, maybe we need to think of uh, the in situ conservation of water on uh, the field itself. So, re excavation of old canal networks and uh, connecting those networks, maybe use of dried up or disconnected creeks as freshwater reservoirs, and certainly, uh, again, this is a capital intensive intervention which is desalination, small scale uh, for schools, villages, and uh, functional uh, centers. May we, we may start off thinking desalination plant, uh, the kind of thing that we have done uh, that that has been done in say Chennai uh, might be a very capital intensive might not be sustainable as well it's very difficult to sustain that kind of thing but what I'm saying is that at least uh, some small scale desalination intervention can also be done uh, the researchers are there they are uh, they have say IIT Mumbai has done something uh, and uh, certain other uh, departments or certain other universities have also done a good work on that so those can also be thought of go to the next one from water, uh, uh, yes, I'm coming to energy. Uh, lack of steady source of electricity is a major problem. Yes, electricity has now reached most of the areas. But what I'm saying uh, in terms of steadiness of the supply, uh, because any kind of a storm or any uh, kind of high wind, uh, the system gets disrupted. And so, and also there are certain other uh, disruptions as well. So maybe tidal power would be a solution. Uh, which was uh, attempted by the government of West Bengal in 2006, uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, this didn't match you, but this didn't succeed. Researchers have also identified certain spots for uh, turbine installations. Uh, experimental energy may also be uh, thought of like hydrogen fuel cell. Solar based solutions might be a good uh, source of energy there. Uh, okay, from energy, uh, let's come to the uh, next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, building. Uh, structures are incapable of withstanding storm surges, floods and cyclones. Storms, floods, cyclones. Uh, most of the structures are not uh, kind of capable of. So what can be done? Storm and flood resilient structures. Structures on steels. Uh, the photograph that you seen which has been developed by uh, uh, Lauren uh, A. Uh, so, he is working in Baripur subdivision. So, certain this kind of structures he has also done, uh, developed. So, these are pretty good in withstanding the ravages of uh, kind of storms and all. I am not talking about these only. What I am saying is that uh, maybe a steel would be a good option because uh, the ground uh, level would be uh, flooded in most of the cases. So, uh, still would be a good option. Maybe local materials, maybe uh, the structures in such a uh, fashion that wind uh, comes and goes out instead of wind uh, kind of being arrested by the structure and thereby weakening the structure. So, that can be done. Uh, and also, what I am uh, kind of uh, very much uh, interested in, to, in seeing is that, that Prime Minister's Awas Yojana Gramin. Uh, or Bangla Rawas Yojana, whatever you call. So, in that Awas Yojana, at least the 161 uh, highly vulnerable villages which have been identified by the researchers, uh, say Professor Chukotaj's paper or his presentation, if you recall. Uh, so, there at least uh, maybe uh, PMAYG and certain additional resources can be clubbed together to ensure that everyone uh, in those villages at least have a good, uh, resilient, a housing stock. It's possible. It's possible if the scale is limited, but right now the 1.2 uh, lakh, 1 lakh 20 thousand rupees, which is usually given to households for construction of uh, a shelter, is absolutely inadequate. So, this has to be augmented. Maybe if we uh, think in terms of some special interventions, the, some kind of a special strategy can be thought of. Okay, go to the next one. I have not talked about the other buildings, other type of buildings, the community buildings and all, mostly steel related. On health, there are a lot of issues. Safe drinking water, uh, right now 58% don't have access, but as I said, uh, this would probably uh, improve. Arsenic in the northern areas, not the Dipopagonas, the six blocks are there. And even in, uh, okay, south of Dipopagonas, the bone blocks are not there, uh, arsenic affected. But in north of Dipopagonas, there are arsenic affected blocks, even within our Sundarbon areas. Lack of access and transport is a major issue, especially in the island areas. Chronic disorder, periodic follow-ups are practically uh, uh, quite hampered because of uh, this 
access uh, uh, kind of deficiency, dependence of rural medical practitioners. I'm not saying that they're bad, but I'm saying that uh, probably people uh, kind of deserve better. So that is also an issue. Hypertension, undiagnosed hypertension is pretty high. Uh, some research papers have pointed out uh, compared to other places. And then unscrupulous elements are also making money um, out of the ailments and all those things. Reason making in case of a disease is a major issue and missing linkage from healthcare providers and patients. What would be the prob uh, probable solutions? Effective community health workers. Uh, maybe uh, they should be updated regularly, give them backup from higher tower for, uh, tire for referral and all. Telemedicine might be an option uh, which uh, often have not succeeded, but at the same time this might be explored as an option. Maybe uh, some volunteers from clusters, the SAG clusters might be selected and uh, to uh, fill the missing link. Maybe 10 households are given to one person and that household will monitor the health status of the people over there uh, with a little bit of training and then they, their task will not be to administer any uh, kind of health facility. Their task will be only identification and reporting. So, and they will be linked with ANA, MASHA workers and all. So, those might be the probable solutions in the health sector. Go to the education one. Next one. Next one, Shabana. Yeah. Education, there are uh, perception of education as waste of time and resources since employment is a major issue and especially for those people residing in remote Sundarbun areas, high dropout rates in upper primary school, this is higher uh, other than Namkhana block in other Sundarbun blocks, this is higher than the uh, other areas. Limited infrastructure and overcrowding in classrooms often uh, that is also there, uh, though now uh, because of uh, kind of the government. Uh, schools are not in a very high demand. So that is why that overcrowding issue is uh, kind of being uh, automatically addressed kind of thing. non availability of teachers in remote or far-flung islands, that's a problem because people usually, the teachers also usually migrate. Uh, there's a kind of upward movement of the teachers to the urban centers and all. So uh, there's a problem. Limited access to undergraduate studies and technical education. There is only one college for every two and 550 square kilometer in the Shundarbun, in the Indian Shundarbun area. Only around 15% of the households have one or more members who have studied beyond secondary level. So uh, they are mostly dependent on low skill jobs. So what might be the solutions? First of all, intensive community interaction for awareness generation, using alternative infrastructure facilities like cyclone shelters, etc., for even imparting education because often education is disrupted because of uh, the ravages caused by uh, cyclones and all. So they are probably alternative infrastructure would be important. Training and deployment of community volunteers they might be of help and skilling interventions would be important. So this is about education. Go to the next one. Uh, on gender equity uh, for there are front, there are uh, several issues. 50% of women are anemic. Malnutrition among girl children is pretty high. Migration and increased burden on women. In, the, in most of the households, you'll see that the male members are migrated. So the women members, they are they uh, they have uh, have to take the load of the male members as well. So their own load is there. Along with that, the load which is to be taken up earlier by the male members, they those have also come to these women. So a doubly loaded kind of a thing. Availability of sanitary napkins, uh, another issue. It is uh, apparently a very small issue, but this is a very critical issue for the women, for the girls and women, uh, because uh, especially during uh, an emergency, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a major problem. Uh, and as I was also earlier talking about that uh, pelvic inflammatory diseases, salt water exposure, those who go uh, for carrying, uh, uh, kind of collecting uh, the fish sheets, uh, mean or uh, the crabs. So those crab catchers, fish seed uh, collectors, even those who are collecting seeds of mangroves and all, they spent hours together on this salt water. And often it has been seen that they have uh, several gynecological complications. Child marriage is a problem, trafficking is a problem, gender violence is on the rise and especially after uh, this, uh, during and after this corona, uh, so COVID-19, uh, it is there. Alcoholism among men is also on the rise. 
what might be the solutions intensive ionized generation activities certainly uh, there is no uh, kind of uh, alternative to that strengthening of the sag network self help group network is important to uh, kind of uh, assert the rights of women and to empower them to raise their voices using sag clusters for production of sanitary napkins as i have talked about the problem so this might be a solution identifying specific gynecological disorders to survey and uh, tying up with the healthcare service providers uh, those might be important from the gender equity part go to the uh, next one which is uh, basically uh, on livelihood go next slide please shabon oh uh, this is migration uh, as i said population density is high urbanization and uh, movement that migration is also uh, happening land conversion is a uh, kind of uh, is another cause of migration people residing in the highly vulnerable areas they need to migrate that is also a uh, 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 truth and human habitations in the areas within the iczm boundaries those also need temporary shifting so what would be the probable interventions planned retreat and rehabilitation for the residents of the vanishing islands have to be to safer places so people have to be uh, kind of uh, strategically moved out from certain vulnerable areas strategic relocation retreat approach north to the tidal activity region and to address the livelihood related migration probably skilling and alternative livelihood sources in the area would be important next slide Yes, micro level spatial distribution of vulnerabilities and subsequent targeted approaches would be important for uh, livelihood uh, from the livelihood angle uh, and from danger to peace that kind of a movement would be required and from damaging the approach is that uh, yes, uh, the livestock there or livestock now what I'm saying is that uh, the animals there are danger, but we need to uh, kind of uh, be at peace with them as well and we need to ensure that uh, our approach would not be uh, damaging uh, the ecosystem it would be protecting the ecosystem synergizing ourselves with the uh, ecosystem and post covid would livelihood loss and increased vulnerability is also a major challenge in livelihood go to some of the livelihood options that we have uh, identified next shabarno yes in agriculture, uh, paddy seed availability has to be increased. High value vegetable crops in polyhouses might be tried out. Uh, there, there might be hub for organic fruits and vegetables. Drip irrigation system and fertigation inside polyhouses uh, for water saving technology uh, kind of use might be important. Drip and sprinklers driven by solar pumps in open areas may also be uh, important. Pathor uh, Pratima chilies are famous. So maybe certain value added products like Jalokia uh, uh, and targeted marketing might be important. Uh, uh, certain uh, kind of salt tolerant uh, traditionally grown uh, paddy varieties would also be important like Dudeshan, Martla, Hamilton, all those things. And hydroponics, uh, simplified kind of a hydroponic system might be tried out experimental. I'm not saying that hydroponics would be a solution but uh, might be some kind of an exploratory thing uh, for the futures. Vertical farming using uh, racks uh, locally available and rice, vegetable, fish, duck, as well as duckweed. So some kind of an integrated farming approach would also be important and certainly uh, integrated pest management. Go to the next one. From agriculture, let's go to the next one, Shravonna. Yes, livestock, there are two uh, very important varieties which probably would be thriving in the Sundarbans. One is garol sheep, which is indigenous, highly adapted to saline environment, which grazes on knee deep aquatic weeds and which has got pretty high prolificacy rate. So the garol sheep, uh, which is now being tried out in other areas as well, is an indigenous product of the Sundarban, uh, but those are gradually uh, withering away. So probably we need to rejuvenate that and black Bengal goat is also uh, pretty highly disease resistant, high prolificacy rate is there and low demand for feed. Uh, so return of investment is high, return on investment is high. So those can also be thought of. Okay, next one. Um, 
quite close to the end. Yes, apiculture uh, might be thought of. I am not uh, detailing out. Uh, there are certain uh, uh, the issues are there. Even when we went there to see uh, after the uh, this cyclone Yash, uh, we saw that after Amphan, uh, most of the uh, bee habitations are lost. Uh, be in the Sundarbund areas, in the, in the in the deep forest area, or or uh, close to the sea and all, uh, are uh, no longer available or have dwindled. So that uh, may be may need some kind of a replacement. Which the forest department is doing, uh, basically uh, forest fringe area that epic mellifera. Uh, so that is also possible uh, in boxes and all. So that forest department is doing. So this is another uh, kind of intervention which may be thought of next. Shravana next, yeah. On aquaculture, there are a lot of opportunities in Sundarbon. Creek or estuarine fishery is important. Cage fishery might be tried out. Integrated mangrove uh, shrimp aquaculture uh, might be a very good uh, kind of a, uh, an uh, attempt which has been done in the Mekong uh, Delta area of Vietnam. And then mud crab. Mud crab uh, usually is happening, mud crab. So, from production to fattening, everything can be done. And water users groups for shared water bodies. So, formation of water user groups would be important, which again, the our uh, WRID, uh, water investigation and uh, kind of development department. So, they are doing water resource investigation and development department. Okay, next one. Entrepreneurship a lot of uh, things can be thought of, uh, small, small one, but when you talk about entrepreneurship, you need to uh, kind of talk about the startups, the ecosystem, and especially certain uh, innovative ventures as well. So for solar fish dryer might be for exporting and all, solar coal storage might be thought of, refrigerated vehicles might be thought of, cheek hatchery, cheek brooding, mushroom, carpentry, certain alternatives, cheap furniture is in demand, uh, exportable handicraft can be developed, garment industry uh, might be good there uh, because uh, a lot of uh, kind of garment uh, producers are from the, those area who usually migrate to the garment hubs. So, all those things are there, block printing, batik uh, might be an important area where they need to reach out to influencers and maybe collaborate with already existing niche brands that might be important. Okay, next one. Tourism, homestays, sustainable tourism, women entrepreneur, eco camp might be good. Uh, educational for children, activity oriented children and adults, so that kind of thing. Uh, and maybe where people will be going, they will do pottery making, they will do cooking in a village setting, traditional cooking, etc., etc., which is very popular in Kerala. Why not in Sundarbon? And by women for women, eco interest based tourism might be another very interesting option for that. And Sundarbon has to be, it has been declared, but what I'm saying is it has to be enforced that this remains a plastic free zone. And Certain adventure sports can also be promoted in certain areas of the Sundarbun by the sea and all. What uh, different other states are doing, we are uh, pretty uh, slow in adapting that. So that can also be done. Next one. Yes, the existing SAG ecosystem can be utilized uh, because they can take uh, the most uh, they may take the most significant role in creating the value chain of vegetables, fruits and other products. Uh, they have their uh, farmers producers uh, organizations, farmers producers companies, cooperatives, all this can be set up and through these uh, we can think of scaling up. Aggregation, storage, processing, packaging, distribution, cold chain management, uh, so even uh, tapping the Kolkata market, those can also be thought of. Go to the next one. I need to close now, yeah, almost. Okay, the cyclone shelters can be used for uh, different uh, activities. It's not money because the cyclone uh, doesn't happen throughout the year. So when the cyclone happens, this will be cleared and immediately people will be rushed there. But in between, there might be certain temporary usage. So that can also be thought of. Go to the next one. Shabana. There shall be, uh, there might be certain scientific surveys. I'm not going into the details of that. Go to the next slide because we have, um, time crunch. Go to the next one, Shabon. 
uh, certain uh, social service can also be thought of. So basically, this is all. Okay, uh, is there another slide, Savona? Can you can you see uh, the next one? Is there any next? Yes. Uh, what I was thinking, since this has been organized by NDMA with Srima Mohila Samiti, maybe certain suggested line of action for the NDMA would be important. See, the State of Environment Report, as I said, uh, which is developed by the state, has little focus on the Sundarban. Can the NDMA initiate a special project for preparation of a focus State of Environment Report for the Indian Sundarban itself? Maybe. So, that's an action point. Uh, can you consider developing an online repository of knowledge products on the Sundarbans, uh, LMS portal, the learning management uh, kind of a portal type? So, LMS portal type something uh, which will be a repository because Sundarban, you know, is uh, the second largest uh, kind of researched uh, geographical entity. First is Amazon, the next is Sundarban. So, a lot of literature is available. In fact, whatever I have suggested is basically called from different literature and some of our experiences. So, it's a combination. So, these literatures often don't reach people. So, can we uh, develop some kind of a knowledge portal, a learning management system where people can log in and there would be videos, there would be papers, there would be uh, instruction sessions and all those things together. People will have a good understanding of the Indian Shundra, of the Sundarbans as such. So that might be another area which can be thought of. And what I have also observed that the district disaster management plans, I have uh, kind of gone through several district disaster, uh, disaster management plans uh, and uh, especially for North and South Indian people. These are mostly cut and paste of the uh, previous reports. It's a stereotype. So, and the stereotype is for the entire district. Can you think of uh, developing a disaster management report for Sundarbon? So, uh, we call it uh, uh, SDMP, Sundarbon Disaster Management Plan. Can you think of that? For uh, So, in that case, you will have to consider contact and be in touch or involve both the districts, South and North and North Tripoganas together, all 19 blocks and there will be a comprehensive Sundarbon disaster management plan, which is uh, basically uh, part of the uh, calling of NDMA as well, because NDMA is supposed to be a responsible uh, or the ministry is supposed to be responsible for uh, helping the states in preparing the district disaster management plans. So, it will be Sundarbon disaster management plan. Can some of the researchers, development professional CSOs be uh, organically involved in that Sundarbon disaster management plan preparation process. So, that can also be thought of. Can there be a special plan for the extremely vulnerable villages, the 161 village uh, that Professor Hajra shared uh, or talked of? Sharing is not a div uh, difficult proposition. If he is asked, he is requested, he will positively share. And then uh, maybe we uh, do a comprehensive planning for these 161 villages to start with. Probably all these uh, taken together will uh, see Sundarbon. Uh, 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 we will see a better future for the Sundarbun, especially the Indian Sundarbun. Thank you very much. I have taken a lot of time, but thank you for uh, giving me that time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, um, we, we are so much pleased to hear from you. Um, sir has been working on the Sundarbun and the Sundarbun and the Sundarbun and the Sundarbun. Sir has pointed out about the state uh, issues of Sundarban and global intervention. Also, the gender equality, migration, livelihood, agriculture, entrepreneurship, and economic upgradation. Sir also has raised few relevant questions to all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving such a lot um, knowledgeable session for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I like to call uh, uh, Mr. Shantanu Chakraborty uh, for giving us special address. Uh, he is the president, the president of the Society for Direct for, Direct for, Direct for Social for and, and, and Disha. Disha. Shantanu Chakraborty Shant is an activist associated with Disha since 2004. He works mainly on environmental conservation and livelihood issues with focus on pollution, coastal and wetland protection and nature-oriented farming. <clears throat> so, sir, 
I'm uh, handing it over to you. Please, sir, continue. Uh, Shaborno, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shabono. Uh, actually, <laughs> I am on flight mode because I need to do that because uh, I, uh, in, to avoid any disturbance because when I'm I'm on mobile. So just in case you want to cut, you need to cut me short. Uh, can you just uh, take down a phone number to uh, which you may call? Uh, the phone number is double nine three three six zero two eight zero eight. Shabondo, did you get it? Uh, sir, pardon, please. please. Can you please? Yeah, I'll repeat. I'll repeat. 993360-2808. Yes, sir. Ah, just in case you need to sort of cut me short at any point, because I understand that there is a time crunch, uh, just call that number. Okay, thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you, Shabondo. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 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 actually, uh, uh, I was listening to this presentation by Mr. Shorkar. It's a highly rich and informative presentation. Uh, and actually, I give a total thumbs up to his call for a national comprehensive policy on the shoulder bones. I don't, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether he meant a national policy. I think he did. But I would like to stress on national because shoulder bone. The problem of the Shundar bone is of such a magnitude and complexity that it cannot be addressed at any regional or state level. It has to be a national policy with a, a lot of lot of synergy and a lot of uh, interface between various parties. We shall hope uh, hope to get to that later. But right now, uh, because. Uh, uh, I would like this talk, my address to be sort of uh, more informal than technical. Uh, and here I would just like to seize this opportunity to convey a, a sense of the predicament of the Sundarbans. Uh, in order to discuss disaster management or any policy regarding the Sundarban, we would just have to get a sense of the kind of place that it is. The problem is that uh, for people who haven't stayed in the Shundarbans or haven't uh, sort of visited it over a length of time, uh, it is difficult to convey a sense for them in a, in a, this kind of talk, even, uh, where even I don't even have a, some kind of a visually eloquent PPT. So, uh, this is very uh, difficult and for people who have been there who are well acquainted with that place uh, i mean uh, no uh, i mean conveying a sense is not necessary so in a way this is useless trying to convey a sense in a, uh, through the, through this kind of talk but still i'll try to convey a sense of what it is to be like to live in the shundu uh, just uh, something comes to mind right now. Uh, in a in, in a novel, I, I'm sure many of you have read that novel by Amitav Ghosh. It's a famous novel, The Hungry Tide. A very a very uh, uh, intriguing uh, picture, a word picture is drawn uh, in one of the pages where it is described that uh, the, one of the protagonists, Kanai is traveling on a boat to the Shundarbans, and from the boat he can see the neighboring villages. And what does he see? At that point, the river is in full flood. And what does Kanai see from the boat? He looks around and he sees the villages at a level below his gaze. He realizes that at that point, when the river is in full flood, the boats are actually floating at a level higher than the, those of the villages. This is perhaps one of the prime predicaments of the Shundarbans. When the rivers are in full flood, 
the geomorphology is such, the terrain is such, that the people living in the Shundurbon actually live below the level of the river. Let me give you another example. 2022, last year, uh, I think the date was 13th July. You see, that night, I don't think, I, I was, uh, on that day I was in Kolkata. That night I did not get to see the moon because it was cloudy as far as I recall. But incidentally, as I learned later, in fact, I learned the following day, we had a super moon, a perigean moon, when the moon is slightly nearer the earth, slightly more than usual. Uh, it's perigee, you know, it's the moon is near at the, uh, near, at the nearest point of the earth in its, in its orbit around the earth. So at that point, its gravitational pull on tides is more. And Shundurbon is the land of tides. Uh, in, in traditional uh, Bengali, it was called the Athenobhati Desh. Uh, we shall get to that later, hopefully. But the point is, when it, uh, the, the, when the, when it is a super moon, the tides are slightly stronger than usual. And it was a full moon day. It was a full moon day. It was a super moon day, Perigean moon. And the tides were very high. And what happened was, I received a call. I remember that evening, I received a call from one of the villages in Goshaba. Yes, Shadjelia. Uh, uh, this is saying that, you know, Dada, the rivers are so high. I mean, it one feels threatened. I mean, people who live with that kind of, you know, uh, living behind embankments in the Shundurbons, protected by embankments, they even they felt that this was a day when anything could happen. And this ha happens very often. Because you see, the Shundurbon is a situation where people are living behind embankments and are living in a situation where the river when it is in full tide, is already threatening the village, even when there isn't a storm. Isn't, there's, there isn't a cyclone like Amphan or Yas to make the tide stronger, and the, I mean, the, the, to, to make the waters flow much higher than usual. Even when there isn't a storm, people are living at the brink of disaster. This is the result of something very strange, you know, one doesn't, I mean, one who hasn't been to the Shundarbons or read, read this history of the Shundarbons doesn't really realize that something has happened there like this. You see, what has happened is, in the last 150 years, jungles have been cleared, in the last 200 years, I think, the jungles have been cleared and embankments set up and the islands protected Islands, uh, I mean, uh, islands which were once beneath, you know, the full, uh, the waters of the full tide, those islands were cleared and embankments set up so that people, when they were living behind embankments, were live, could live there by just shutting, off the, shutting out the tide. The result was that the rivers came during full flood, they couldn't get into the islands. And all the silt that could have otherwise flooded those islands fell in the river and slowly the river bottom continued to rise. Slowly the river bottom continued to rise because you see the river, the silt, all the silt was falling inside the river. In this manner, what happened was that the river slowly lost its volume or its height. And slowly what happened was during full tide, the waters were flowing at a much higher level. So this is the normal state of affairs in the Shundarbon. People are living at a level, I mean, residing at a level beneath the surface of the river. Second, what happens when there is a storm and the embankments are breached or the river flows into the village over the embankments? The soil gets salinated and then you don't have a crop. And in the last, what, 50 to 70 years, many of the tra traditional rice varieties have gone away. And uh, what has happened is that uh, the new varieties, the hybrid varieties, they are not that salt tolerant. 
So you have a huge problem of crop production in the Sundarbans. Some, uh, I mean, the issue has been covered excellently by Mr. Sharkar, who has mentioned a few traditional rice varieties. And in fact, there are several civil society organizations right now working in Sundarbans, trying to bring in many of the older varieties like Talmugur, like Boyarbat, like Kalomota, Sadamota, and so on. So that, you know, these are salt tolerant varieties and they can, you know, uh, fare better in the Shundarans. Actually, uh, the thing about Shundarbans is it is not one set of problems. I, I particularly em emphasized on the embankment protected and disaster, you know, disaster riding existence of the Shundarbans. If, I mean, people are living with disaster or with almost disaster every day. That kind of thing we I described, I emphasized on it. But Shundarbans, the complexity of Shundarbans is that it, it is a lot of things. For example, Shundarbans is a mangrove forest. It is a coastal estuarine area. It is, uh, it is, a, it is a place with a very rich ecology. It, has a, it is a place where close to the forest, people are living close to the forest and living, uh, but there are some 4 to 4.5 million people living there. And uh, this is a place where uh, uh, you have uh, a lot of salt water all around you. And uh, it is, it, nowadays it is recognized as a Ramsar site. And there are issues of forest management. There, issue, there are issues of ecological protection. There are severe issues of livelihood. There are severe issues of disaster management. All these are there. And that is why, as Mr. Sharkar was saying, we need a comprehensive policy. The thing is that the thing about comprehensive policies is that they sound very good. But bringing all the issues together under one policy umbrella or one set of policy umbrellas and managing them and managing them in a way that it really gets implemented and it really works is a very, is an almost insurmountable problem. And, you know, personally, I don't feel very, very optimistic because, uh, well, if history is any guide, we human beings are not very good at working comprehensive problems and coming up with comprehensive solutions. But if we, it is a fact that if we need to address the Sundarbans issue, we need to have a comprehensive set of approaches under perhaps a major umbrella, a single major umbrella. But another important thing is that, you see, somewhere in this entire policy thinking about the Shundarbon, we need to bring the people in. Up to now, all the management uh, policies that have been created by the forest department, by the forest authorities, the, the, the block development authorities, by the state government, uh, and so on, all have been some, it's somewhere they are, they are top down things. They are not the result of working out a, 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 an approach after listening to the people who actually live in the Shota. In order to create a policy, we need to have the people somewhere as authors of the policy also. It's not only just going and listening to what the people say in a few islands or in a few areas and then sort of uh, putting it in, inside the policy. Somewhere people who live there have certain experiences which have to be utilized. In order to utilize them, we need the people inside the policy making itself. How you do go about doing that? That's another question, but that is something that needs to be addressed. Because you see the fishing community, I have had some experience working with the fishing community in the Shundarbans. The fishing community have their own set of problems. The farmers have their own set of problems. 
hundreds of thousands of people who have left the Sundarbans, who have actually voted with their feet against the Sundarbans in a way by just leaving it, they have faced problems which they could not cope earlier and that is why they left. Even today, they have a very large migration, seasonal migration, permanent, also permanent migration from the Sundarbans. Why? Why is this happening? What is going wrong? What is the actual experience of the people living there? That has to be taken into account by somehow having the people uh, in, uh, come into the authoring of the policy itself. So that is one thing that I feel very strongly that many of us feel very strongly. Once again, how we go about doing that, how that is, that is to be done is something that has to be worked out. Uh, last but not the least, people say that po politics is the, is the art of the possible. We cannot implement any vision or any direction just like that. Uh, we can work with whatever is possible and viable. So not only politics, but policy and implementation on the ground are the arts of the possible. So we have to find out what really works what can work under these circumstances and go about trying to implement it. So I hope I have not taken too much of your time. I'm very grateful whatever little time you did afford, uh, I mean, I was given. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, sharing about the uh, special address. <clears throat> we all know that sir has many experience to work with the fishing community, especially in Sundarbans. Sir has shared a few examples here, and embankment protection, people involvement, especially in fish, fishing community. Uh, now, uh, thank you, sir, for this. And now I am like to call uh, um, Sharoni, uh, Ms. Sharoni, uh, for Dr. Sharoni Vishar for uh, introducing us about the improving climate resilience of the community through integrated natural resource management in coastal Sundarbon. Uh, uh, Ma'am has more than 10 years working experience in forestry research, natural resource management, livelihood, DRR, and climate change, and involved in research and training activities in different states in, of India especially West Bengal, Bihar, etc. She is also the principal investigator for DST Women Scientist A project entitled Ecosystem Services and others. And she has, was an environment specialist also. Uh, so ma'am, now I'm like to hand it over. Please continue your speech. Uh, you are not audible. Uh, I think Shangumitra ma'am has uh, unmuted his her call. So I cannot hear properly from And uh, Sharon, you are not audible still. Hello. 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 Hello, ma'am. 
हेलो हेलो शंगोमित्र मैम हेलो हेलो कैन यू हियर मी प्लीज म्यूट योर कॉल शंगोमित्र मैम प्लीज म्यूट योर कॉल इट इज नाउ टाइम फॉर शारोनी विश्वास डॉक्टर Ma'am, till you are not audible. I think, Shravana, it's better to go for the next one and then come back. Yes, sir. Now I'm like to uh, call. Uh, um... डॉक्टर शंकरमित्र मुखर्जी, सीईओ, सिमित्रम इन्वर्टन मैनेजमेंट, शी विल इनलाइटेन आस अबाउट द पोल्यूशन एंड रिस्क इन शुंदरबान चैलेंजेस एंड वोइज। नाउ प्लीज शंकरमित्र मैम कंटिन्यू। अकेले ही बोलो। ना ना ये बोला हमने बुक से नीचे। रिसोर्सेस सावन लाख का Ma'am, you are audible. Kindly continue. Shangamitra, ma'am, you are audible. Kindly continue. Team chat. Oh, the video will be super, 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 super. Mangamitra ma'am, you are audible. Kindly please continue. Allah ma'am, I think you are missing. Guys, I have a combo of lights. Madam Shangamitra Mukherjee, please be on call. I think you are not being able to understand that people are waiting for your presentation. Angomitra ma'am, can you continue? Doctor, if I could unmute, mute for the mic. So I want to send her a message. I think she can uh, cannot hear us, but um, we can hear her. Send her a message. Or, or look, or, or look for someone. हेलो हेलो सुना जा सकते हैं हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल यस यू आर ओके थैंक यू सॉरी फॉर द इनकॉन्वेनिएंस आई मेक टू भाव चलूँ बहुत है आई नो सो टुडे आवर टॉपिक रिगार्डिंग शुंदरों ने इस पोल्यूशन एंड रिस्क इन शुंदरों बट ऑनेस्टली बहुत है एक टू कॉम बोलो so recently what we have seen that pollution obviously it's not only for Shundarbon or Kolkata or anywhere place like that so it cannot be confined but in general if we can Shabana can I see the PPT please yes we can we can I'm sharing
so my topic will uh, in general rotate around west because west is a thing which creates lot of pollution we may not know that what kind of pollution it is creating but just i will give a small overview about it we know but we are not very careful and a little bit uh, i will try to focus on the solution that we can find out for this garbage is and the west so the first thing what i would like to share about is my little experience of visiting a sundarbol uh, island so when i went there i thought oh my god it's so clean why people have called me to talk about, about west management here and when i reached the spot i asked them uh it's quite clean i am saying it's quite clean so they told ma'am it's a rainy season so what happens in rainy season that all the waste gets disposed off to the water to the nearby ocean we are being born so basically the waste is just washed away to the ocean so when once it goes to the ocean we are not aware that what is happening so i will just give a small overview overview about the waste management mismanagement what is happening in the land and we can just uh, have a comparison of that management with a sea because sea is the nearest part of sundarbon it's inside the sea almost so all the waste when it is going to the sea what is happening we can have a idea about that can i have the slides or oh, if the slides are already there yeah so in the previous picture we saw saw that there is a canal and canal is just locked with lot of west at the same time the next slide we we see next slide we see that the west is just dumped around and animals are eating something from the packets which which are lying there and as a consequence what happens the next slide we see in the next slide that it's a dead cow can you see the dead cow so the dead cow is having lots and lots of plastic in the stomach it's not a photoshopped one it is a real picture and we also came to know from a few years back there was a news which popped up that a big well was die, has died just for eating lot of for consuming not eating it's not eating but it consumed lot of plastic and they found 7 tons of plastic from the stomach of the whale so the plastics once it goes to the oceans are consumed by the animals and these are the consequences we at present know that even in the mother's milk even in the mother's milk microplastics are is when it has been found so a mother's milk has been polluted can you imagine that we are taking cow's milk thinking it's a healthy option for eating and we are actually consuming something which is really poisonous so pollution does not means only environmental pollution but we are polluting our self also we are polluting our health also next slide so once this garbage is comes in a heap we often find smoky mountains in the urban area in rural places we often see that the plastics mainly the plastics are burned they are burned because they have no idea what is happening with 
by this burning of these plastics. This plastics, when it burns, it produces a lot of carcinogenic gases. So this carcinogenic gases is very, very harmful for your health. Next. I will go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So if we think, okay, the burning is taking place in my place, why to bother? But can you think that smoke is not confined in your place? Smoke cannot be confined in your place. This is a big fire in a landfill. And in the next slide, next slide please, we see from a internet picture, that is a, from a whole picture that this uh, smoke, the, that landfill was Teonan landfill and the smoke is traveling a long distance. So whatever burning we do here is actually polluting the whole world. Not only my place, my city, my country, but internationally it is damaging each and every part of the universe. So prevent this kind of practices. What we need is, we need to first, we need to generate awareness regarding the health hazard. Not only the health hazard, also the hazard of the environment. Because I am burning the gas, I am burning the plastic, the gas is not confined within, within my circle, but it is traveling and it is hampering the whole society. So it's causing pollution. So how we can reduce this pollution. These are man-made. Obviously, it is a disaster, but, but it is man-made disaster. So this man-made disaster can be controlled. It can be controlled by generating minimum awareness programs and letting them know what is actually happening and how it can be controlled. Next slide. So in next slide, we can find that Prevention is the best thing to reduce pollution created from these garbages. Prevention, minimization, reuse, recycling, energy recovery, and final is the disposal. But often we have seen that the thing what happens is disposal. Just they are using and throwing it away. One my very painful experience in Hingol Conch was I am seeing that some of the ponds, lot of plastics are floating on the ponds. I asked the owner of the pond that who, who has put these plastics in your pond? So he said, ma'am, it's my garbages from the home. So I told him, so you are polluting your own pond. And the answer was, was it's my pond. What is your headache? So people have started thinking even the water, which is just by the side of his house, is his own water. No, it's not his own water. It's the water of the nature. It's the water from the earth. It's of the society. It's of the whole universe. So we don't have this minimum thought process that it's not me and only mine. It's all. It's whole universe. So little bit pollution, we are thinking, I'm throwing only a packet. I'm throwing only a bottle. I'm throwing this. But I am polluting the whole world. That is the thing. And for preventing all this kind of thing, a lot of laws has also been uh, proposed. And it, is also, it has also come out, come out as a law. So next to next slide, please. Next. So there is a solid waste management rule 2016, which clearly says that we have to segregate our waste. We have to manage the biodegradable waste by ourselves. And we can hand over the plastic waste or the non-recyclable waste to a proper recycler. 
but this proper recycler is also a question at present but okay at least something should be recycled so this recycling or the using of plastics can be shown this can be uh, there are a lot of process by which people of sundarbon can use their own waste and generate little 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 bit of wealth from that i will not say wealth because people start thinking oh my god where is the money so money is not only the rupees what you are seeing money or wealth is actually your health your environment is the wealth that idea or that knowledge they should have so for that what is the most important thing they should know how to use their garbages so now if we can move to the next slide next and next next show so this is from the biodegradable waste part biodegradable waste can be used in two way minimum it has many other uses but at least composting and biogas generation is a very common thing which can be done obviously in uh, we may think that oh okay sundarbon there are a lot of animals they are eating all the vegetables but that's a sad story because vegetable waste are not only produced at home but also in the market places so once it is produced in the market places often when we go there we see that okay surrounding the market places even if there is a water body that water body gets contaminated with the biodegradable waste because people often think oh this will go into the earth but for going into the earth also there are some process so they they are throwing it into water bodies or in a improper way and sometimes these are also causing danger to the society am i audible saborno sorry to disturb no no okay thank hello thank you thank you ma'am please yeah, continue yeah, yeah yeah um so so there are some small processes which needs less uh, area and the processing can be done which is called composting biogas formation from this biogas some cooking gases can be form, uh, produced and that can be used as a cooking gases there are small composting vessels next next slides please next so these are small uh, composting unit which can be installed or made at your own home own, own place where you can do the composting by using small small domestic level things which will help to convert the biodegradable waste to compost next it's very important to manage the dry waste because in a uh, village type of area though sundarban is not only made uh, made up of only villages but there are uh, small small towns also but even if, if we focus on the village there are lot of problem produced due to this dry waste people have a habit of taking cups tea tea cups which is made up of paper or made up of plastic all the packaging goods are going in form of plastics even a biscuit maggi whatever it is the packaging are going even if i think that okay we are banning this plastic this much plastic is will be bad but all the packaging goods are going there and the packaging produces lot of plastic plastic waste which is really a issue to be solved in sundarban because at sundarban what we found was a difficult part is to collect all this plastics and transport it to the uh, bigger towns we tried to do that but transporting is obviously a difficult issue for sundarban so uh, just to say we have some we have organized some small training programs with the uh, some of the ngos where we trained them how to make uh things from pack this pack packaging kind of plastics or we have also made them uh, make make them use uh, made paper handmade paper from the uh the tea cups which are lot of lot of tea cups are produced in the local areas because nowadays the local bhar that is 
local things are not there and most of the people are using this tea cups which are made up of paper which again is a cause of pollution there because often we think that paper are biodegradable but these these papers have a plastic layers which uh, is hampering the soil so it's better to make some small small training programs with the island people and if the product is sellable that can be taken to the different cities and that can again produce some entrepreneurship model for people staying there next slide please so a big problem is plastic waste but there are a lot of technology i will not go into the technology part because there are a lot of technology to manage the plastic we often say plastic is like a giant but plastic is not the giant we are the bad people who are not we, we don't know how to use plastic and how to dispose plastics we are the actual culprit for producing the plastic waste so once the, the if there is a mechanism of proper collection and transportation of plastic we can assure that 100% of the plastic can be recycled reused or can be used even the packaging plastics which are creating problem in the environment has a process of utilizing it in co processing which can be used in uh, in place of coal in scientific way not like in bari ka chula mein jala diya so there are a lot of way which are scientific and that can be done if and only if the proper disposal and collection and transportation is available so by following minimum principle of segregation and utilization of waste we are actually going to promote the circular economy which is extremely needed because this resource should be managed because the nature is giving us the resource and if we use them and destroy them nature will die one day and it will it will take revenge but if we can recycle the thing we can actually prevent the destroying of the nature and we can help nature to grow and we can at least live a longer life with a with a good nature which is extremely needed thank you thank you ken uh, thank you ma'am thank you for sharing uh, lots of uh, knowledge to us ma'am uh, has pointed out about many thing about waste hierarchy uh, about dry waste management plastic disaster plastic waste management and circular economy it is a very excellent session uh, to hear from you now i like to call uh, dr sharoni vishwas for uh, enlighten us it's over to you ma'am thank you uh, just uh, wait i will just share this slide am i audible now yes ma'am you are audible okay so uh, we are running short of time i think so without any uh, much of the discussion or introduction uh, i'm directly uh, moving on to the uh, topic like improving the climate resilience of the community through integrated natural resource management in coastal sundarbans so here i will uh, just highlight the different strategies uh, which has been adopted in the sundarban region and uh, how it is enhancing the life and livelihood of the people of that area so uh, it is a part of a project which was funded by cgrf uh, washington dc and the implementing agency was drcsc uh, kolkata now the goal of the project was to uh, certain the different livelihood options and the patterns which were been adopted by the local communities and how you assess the socio economic vulnerability status of the community so until and unless you analyze the exact uh, situation or the socio economic vulnerability or the well being of a particular community or an individual then you cannot uh, 
actually uh, intervene in those areas or you cannot actually uh, go for the different strategies you, you are going to uh, implement. And one of the most important goal of uh, that particular project was to restore the ecosystem and ensure the food, nutrition and livelihood security of all the climate vulnerable communities who are residing in Sundarbans. And uh, this would also present uh, this uh, will be helpful in uh, giving or formulating the policy and a strategy uh, that uh, can be adopted. Now, the study area was uh, for the four blocks of uh, two districts uh, where the target population was uh, around 1600 and uh, it covers 13 villages. Now for the data collection, we used uh, different uh, characteristics of the population. Those were uh, identified. Then a structured questionnaire at household level was uh, uh, prepared, focus group discussions, and uh, different participatory rural appraisal tools were applied. Here I'll just uh, give you some example of the sample of the participatory rural appraisal tools, which uh, we carried out in that particular area. So uh, like the resource map or the uh, social map, which will give you a clear view of the resource availability of a particular village or of a particular area, how the community is structured uh, about their uh, settlements, the schools and all uh, that you can easily view. And all these things are done in active participation of the community. Similarly, the crop calendar, the hazard ranking, whatever the types of crops are currently before the intervention of the uh, different strategies related to the agricultural activities and livelihood generation, uh, what the crops they used to grow, what is their uh, time of sowing and harvesting, how they rank the hazard which is occurring actually in those areas, what is their perception that is also been uh, sampled similarly seasonal scarcity calendar like it will entail uh, the uh, scarcity of fodder scarcity of food the firewood uh, drinking water scarcity job scarcity and all in which a month they are uh, not having uh, the job or they are lacking of food or uh, fodder anything so that is uh, in in a in a uh, in a form of uh, the seasonal uh, scarcity calendar. Similarly, the mobility map or livelihood portfolio of the people are also uh, assessed. After that, what we do is when we are going for the household survey, we are identifying the human well-being indicators for the study area. And for that, we use uh, four elements like basic human needs, which include different types of components like food, shelter, education, employment. And it has got different indicators uh, that will give you the measurement of the indicators. And finally, for uh, this economic well-being, when environmental well-being, social well-being, uh, certain uh, indicators were set uh, through the questionnaire and uh, the actual uh, quantified data was recorded and it was transformed into a particular scale, either a Likert scale was used or a specific uh, number or scale was used. Uh, depending upon the different indicators. And ultimately, after getting the uh, results, the Human Development Index uh, was calculated using the UNDP's uh, equation. And from there, uh, we get the indicator index score. And if you uh, average the index indicator score, uh, then you can get the component uh, score. And if you uh, finally average the component score, it will get the composite well-being score. So in that way, we uh, analyzed and uh, get the score for different areas, for different elements, as well as for different components. And finally, we find that the composite socioeconomic well-being score is uh, very low for the areas. And uh, we can easily justify and conclude that uh, the people or the community members for whom we are considering as the target population or the target beneficiaries for a particular project, they are in vulnerable situation and their well-being is not up to the mark. Now, uh, after that, the prioritization of all the issues or the problems were uh, considered depending upon their uh, discussion and active participation of uh, the people. So I'm not uh, reading it out. Uh, these are more or less same as the uh, different causes and uh, this, uh, reasons for the vulnerability. Uh, 
prevailing in the area. Now coming to the actions, the actions were uh, divided into five components. First one is to ensure supply of nutrition food throughout the year, to have the uh, increase in biodiversity and integrated farming system uh, implementation so that we can have the higher productivity as well as enhancing the income through sale of uh, surplus. Then group based income generation initiatives, uh, protecting life, livelihood and environment through community plantation, regeneration and afforestation activities and strengthening the local institutions. So here I will just uh, give you some examples of the different strategies which were uh, taken up during the uh, implementation of the project and uh, that will uh, highlight the component one, two and four. For the uh, first uh, component, you see uh, the, uh, a small uh, nutrition garden is encouraged to every beneficiaries and support for the vermicompost, uh, peats, or uh, the manure, or livestock farming, rainwater harvesting structures. Certain uh, initial uh, support was given to the beneficiaries, and then uh, accordingly, the training and capacity building sessions were. Uh, uh, there. Now, regarding the subsystem of nutrition garden models, it include uh, three subsystems. One is your nutrition garden with the vermicompost uh, chari model nutrition garden that will include the livestock rearing and integrated nutrition garden that will include the nutrition garden as well as vermi peat. A hen house or livestock rearing as per their choice uh, it, it may be uh, only hen or may, may be poultry or uh, goat or both anything and rainwater harvesting structure now after the in uh, intervention you see uh, this is uh, one uh, lady whose uh, monthly income was just below 4000 and before the uh, intervention of the, the work or the actions uh, her uh, production in uh, the homestead land where he where she used to grow a few crops only uh, that is hardly 80 to 90 kgs but that has been increased to many fold after the introduction of the sustainable technology or the sustainable agricultural technologies which have been implemented in her household. Similarly, the income from her garden was maximum of 8,000, more than 8,000. Income from egg and hen was also enhanced. It is uh, near to about 14,000. And uh, similarly, if you go on looking into the uh, design of the kitchen garden before the project, uh, market dependency was there and chemical input was coming from the market and it was not well integrated. But after the um, intervention, you see uh, market dependency is all there only for a few months, uh, that is only for the poultry rearing and other things they are uh, uh, carrying their excess crops after uh, consumption to the market. They're selling it. They're using the organic manures and compost for their uh, crop land or their vegetable garden. They are using the rainwater harvesting tank and 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 uh, some uh, uh, fish are also cultivated in that tank and in this way some integration is uh, given and around the year they are getting um, different seasonal crops and uh, not only the adequate supply of uh, food but also the nutritious supply of food is reached to the household now coming to the component two where we introduced the integrated farming system, it included uh, five subsystem like upland cultivation, lowland cultivation, aquaculture, livestock rearing and organic manure preparation unit. So we all know most of us that uh, integrated farming system is uh, beneficial in terms of uh, employment generation, enhanced productivity, uh, biodiversity and enrichment or conservation uh, providing uh, security to the uh, livelihood as well as nutritional and food security and also it is climate resilient and enriching the soil quality of the area now uh, therefore it is also known as the ecologically sustainable method that integrates the different components of natural resources and it also includes the shaping of farmland and uh, introduction of different uh, indigenous uh, crop varieties, saline tolerant uh, crops, and uh, a number of uh, things. 
Now here also in this case study also you see uh, this lady uh, has transformed her land uh, or cultivated land into a IFS and total amount of production in terms of money she is getting. Uh, you see from fruits she is getting 19,000 from vermicompost itself she is getting 15,000 uh, like that way and annual income was uh, enhanced and her income was just doubled after uh, transferring uh, transforming her land to IFS model and annual income was about rupees 95,000 and uh, whatever she is uh, selling in the market or whether it is a fruit or vegetable or fish or uh, seeds or whatever it is just after the consumption in her household and also she is distributing some uh, amount to her neighbors so in this way it is uh, sustaining and this is helping in uh, enhancing the livelihood and production similarly for uh, the uh, azola and vermipede the uh, compost of which they are vermicompost which have been produced they they also sell them in the market and uh, i've highlighted the pig rearing uh, there there was a tribal community uh, in in a hingalganj block and uh, they the, the number of beneficiaries they used to rear pig and their maximum income was 26000 now, before the intervention, you see here also you will find the market dependency is there. Inputs, so chemical inputs was coming from the market and uh, poultry feed is also coming uh, from the uh, market, but uh, and integration is not much. Uh, the waste of one unit, but after the intervention, the waste of uh, one unit is utilized as a wealth in some other unit in the subcomponent. Then uh, if you look into this uh, market uh, aspect, uh, every nothing is coming or they are um, they are not buying anything from the market they are selling their crops they are selling their vegetables uh, paddy they are selling animal products they are selling uh, the different other items to the market and uh, whatever uh, is required for uh, this one like fertilizers and all for uh, their uh, um, farmland it has been supplemented by the vermi and uh, azola peat. So in this way, uh, this integration is done and uh, there are certain other uh, uh, techniques and other activities also. So I've just given uh, the few pictures like crab culture or crab fattening, mushroom cultivation. Uh, then, then this uh, floating garden is uh, one of the most uh, uh, this, uh, interesting one. Under, under this floating garden, the key, uh, in a cage, the fish uh, cultivation is also there. Then multi, if the, if the space of a homestead land is very uh, less, then we can go for the multi tar cultivation. So, and in this way, a number of options are there and we can easily adapt or uh, implement such uh, techniques and we can easily uh, adapt the um, changes. Now coming to the uh, fourth component, the afforestation and regeneration of natural habitats. You see, uh, often we talk about the afforestation, plantation, and uh, we all know the importance and significance of uh, it. But actually here, I would also like to mention the uh, most important thing is the ecosystem services or the ecosystem, uh, the benefits which we are getting from the ecosystem that is uh, day by day, it is uh, getting degraded due to climatic uh, changes and uh, disaster which is occurring or the natural hazards which are occurring and also uh, the life and livelihood is dependent uh, mostly on the ecosystem services uh, maybe uh, provisional services or the regulatory services cultural services or supporting services so life and livelihood is solely dependent upon the uh, ecosystem services so we should also apart from this agricultural interventions uh, sustainable um, technologies and uh, all we should also give uh, focus on the ecosystem services and we should also try to evaluate the ecosystem services uh, so and then we should also try to know the perception of the people over the area uh, how they are evaluating their uh, own resources what they are using and also in terms of economy uh, so here I have just highlighted the few uh, mangrove tree species which were planted uh, around 15.17 hectare uh, plantation was done uh, for mangrove trees and uh, 
here um, by using different variables like measuring the height, measuring the uh, wood specific gravity and diameter at breast height, you can easily uh, get the uh, total biomass of a particular tree and you can uh, estimate the carbon stock or the carbon which has been sequestered or the potentiality of carbon sequestration of a particular species. Now the, the total number of species you are, uh, it's, it's, it's there in the area and uh, extrapolating the uh, things you can easily uh, get the result of the such and such uh, area or such and such amount of CO2 is uh, sequestered or such and such amount of carbon stock is uh, present in this uh, particular area by uh, uh, such and such uh, uh, trees. So in this way, this is uh, one lady from uh, from a group. Uh, she used to monitor the plantation uh, and, and, and she uh, used to take care of uh, the uh, plantations in her uh, area. Similarly, the multipurpose trees or social forestry, which were uh, one of the action under this uh, component. Uh, here, a number of uh, this, uh, trees, uh, different types of trees were planted. And this was also uh, giving you the idea of the carbon stock or uh, CO2 uh, sequestration. And this will also help you in assessing uh, the, uh, the success of the uh, project and also how you are uh, uh, this acting on the or how you are responding on the carbon footprint uh, in that particular area. So how much reduction you did that is also very important in terms of when you are uh, going for this afforestation activities and planting uh, activities so that's all in short uh the, uh, and then the conclusion are uh, obviously the crop diversification, enhanced production, uh, food insecurity has reduced, different saline tolerant uh, seed local varieties uh, are proven to be climate resilient. They also require very less amount of water and heat tolerant. And during the time of cyclone or flood uh, situation, roots and tubers uh, remain alive. And also the people who are having the floating uh, garden, uh, they are also getting uh, the supply of food in uh, till till certain uh, time period. Mixed cropping prevents the pest attack, and uh, the application of organic this uh, vermicompost or manures it it is helping in lowering the compaction of the soil. Uh, there was a sharp shift from the use of chemical fertilizers to organic manure. Then the trellis and sack cultivation, raised beds that uh, this was uh, successful in this area. Rearing local breed, this is also helping in uh, protein supply or enhancing the income of the uh, household and also prevents the outbreak of uh, diseases of the livestock. Uh, then rainwater harvesting is also very useful for such saline zone. It is providing uh, this uh, irrigation uh, for the nutrition garden and also the drinking water for livestock. Pond in IFS models, they are also storing water for dry period. Uh, and uh, waste is also right. utilized. And they finally, if we go on intervening this uh, kind of uh, this uh, interventions, then uh, the climate resilient agricultural intervention will fulfill the sustainable development goals, specifically goal one, goal two, and goal three. So uh, that's all. So due to the time constraint, uh, I, just, I was just uh, trying to wrap it out. So that's all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for sharing these wonderful slides. Uh, ma'am has shared uh, about the causes of vulnerabilities, action plans, component-wise. Uh, she also share, shared many examples. Uh, she had talked about the subsystem of uh, many nutrition garden, economic development, ecosystem services, etc. It was an excellent session today. Thank you all. Uh, I'd like to thank, from core of my heart, to Sri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM. I'd like to thank Professor Shantosh Kumar, Head DI, GIDRR, NIDM, and Ms. Bani Saraswati, Secretary, Srima Mohila Shamiti, West Bengal. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ali, ha Ali Haider, Junior Consultant, NIDM, Mr. Vivek Sharma, Young Professional, NIDM. 
uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Shantanu Chakraborty for giving us special address about Shundurman. And also, Mr. Dibendu Shorkar, uh, uh, IAS retired, Dr. Shangamitra Mukherjee, Dr. Sharoni Vishash, for giving us or enlightening us such a knowledgeable session. And I'd like to thank Professor Shantush Kumar, NIDM. Um, I, thank you all. Uh, as a society, Sri Mamala Shamiti, we always like to save our mother, Shundarbon. We should come together more and more to save this heritage delta, the land for endangered species and the land for Royal Bengal Tiger. Srimamala Shamiti has been working for community people and nature since 1972. Now, we think it is a time to implement more strategies to save Shundarbon and Gangetic Basin in southern part of West Bengal. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, NIGM. Thank you, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, for giving us this kinds of opportunity to conduct this program. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, participants all. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, sir.